Good morning, everyone. Um, today um, is a special day for our Department of Biomedical Engineering here at FIU. Um, we are celebrating the work and life of what we believe is not only the first Cuban biomedical engineering, but perhaps one of the first biomedical engineering worldwide. Um, we have been uh, for about five years trying to establish um, an endowment for a scholarship to honor um, Domingo Gomez de Jimeranes, who is uh, the person who we are celebrating, uh, the reason for this celebration. Um, the organizer of this event is myself um, and Dr. Hutchinson and uh, a an student, Daniel Smith. But when we are, um, when we talk about the life of Domingo, we have to always keep in mind certain serendipities that make it possible for him to become that celebrity. And we have to link his life to two um, other uh, celebrities um, that are, have an origin in Cuba. And the first one that I'm going to refer here is to Jose Maria de Heredia. It uh, was a Cuban-born French Parnassian poet. He was a 15 member elect for seat four of the Academia France, France, Francia in uh, 1894. And among his work, um, he's very well known for Le Trophée. Um, so this is the first person that have indirectly a connection with Domingo. The second person is Joaquin Abaran. Um, he was also a Cuban-born French urologist, and he received the Order of the Legion of Honor of France. Abaran is known for many contributions to, to urology, but in particular for the Abaran level work in insert deflecting bridge, a device for adjusting the movement of a cytoscope during the catheterization of the ureter. In 1912, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize in Medicine. He in particular studied histology with Dr. Rambier for people um, in the area of neuroscience who recognize this name as the one that discovered, um, they introduced the myelin uh, in neurons. Action. So why these names are connected to Domingo? And it's because Professor Henry Barquez and Professor Jean Glay visited Cuba in 1921 because this modest colonial country are given to France these two remarkable personalities. When they were in Cuba, they expressed their desire to bring with them to France, a young Cuban choosing among the best for his education in medicine. And that person coming from a very modest and poor family was Domingo Gomez Jimeranes, who was at that time in the second year of medical studies. Here is a picture of that moment, um, that year, in 1921, just uh, the spring after Domingo arrived, with uh, Dr. Gomez indicating here with the arrow, and all the personalities um, in, a, in a meeting uh, related to cardiology, including Dr. Basque and Dr. Clay. So in general, we can say his education was from the best in the areas of 
um, of medicine, but also in the area of mathematics and physics. So he, he first uh, was in the La PT under Professor Henry Vaquez to get a solid training in clinical cardiology and completed a series of publications in different aspects of cardiology as we will discuss today. Then he was also at the College de France under Professor Glade a great physiologist, a carry out certain amount of experimental work concerning the circulation in animals, which were pub published in various medical papers and academies. But what is one of the most remarkable um, fact here is that he was not only restricting himself to the area of biology and medicine, but he wanted to expand his knowledge to mathematics and physics. So he enrolled in the, in the Sorbonne to study mathematics and was able to um, work in the College of the France with uh, Professor Paul Langevin, one of the great French phys phys physicists and mathematicians. And with him, he was able to do theoretical work as applied to the blood circulation and invented uh, uh, certain devices to measure blood pressure and all the parameters in uh, blood circulation. So for all this reason, for his doctor in medicine in Paris and uh, a year later achieving the, the mathematics a degree at uh, La Sorbonne, we consider um, him as the first Cuban biomedical engineer, engineer. His work was focused on mathematical models, substance distribution in organs, in particular blood and gases. Hemodynamic, he created a theoretical framework to study uh, blood flow and uh, although we have not been able to uh, find it yet because it was, um, according to sources, it was um, transferred to Russia in 1959. He's uh, uh, the uh, person who introduced the first artificial heart. So thanks to the general support of uh, the, court, the Wallace Carter Foundation, the Department of Biomedical Engineering have organized a whole day program to celebrate the life of and work of the first Cuban biomedical engineering, Dr. Domingo Gomez de Gimnada. The program is very extensive and very exciting. We will have a keynote speaker from Columbia University that we'll be just introduced in a moment. We will have a whole session to discuss the achievement and our department in a particular area of cardiology and heart research, chair by Dr. Hutchinson. And we will have uh, a forum around his uh, Domingo's life with uh, Daniel Smith and uh, his daughter, Sita Gomez, and perhaps all the family members, moderator. Then we will have a break. Um, we will have an interview to Edward Weaver, and um, we have at 2.30 a review of the work and legacy of Domingo by myself. And then we will have the conclusion. Now I would just um, ask um, our chair, Dr. Rano John, to um, introduce our keynote speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Gordana Wunjak Nowakwe. Dr. Gordana is world famous as a biomedical engineer who has led the effort for stem cells and tissue engineering. She's at Columbia University, a National Academy of Engineering Fellow. She hosts the National Institutes of Health Lab for Tissue Engineering. She has made several, several 
major breakthroughs in this field that have impacted not just a small area, but the whole global growth of this particular area of study. She um, is or she uh, graduated with her uh, bachelor's, master's, and PhD in chemical engineering from University of Belgrade in Belgrade, Serbia. Her recognition by her own birth country is so huge that this year she was awarded the Srentek Order of the Republic of Serbia, which I understand is the highest honor that the country could have given her. She is also um, uh, elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And if you have not had an opportunity um, to uh, see the movie Tes Tesla Nation, she appears as herself in Tesla Nation. She brings today to us a very special link because of her original uh, uh, background and her uh, from, from Europe. Where, uh, uh, where our celebration for Dr. Domingo takes us. And she also has a Miami connection and a pulmonary connection because her son is a physician right here in Miami. I have had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Gordana for, I'm skipping your last name, Dr. Gordana, because I think I'm messing, messing it up. So it has been a pleasure to know you for some, several years now. And we are so, so thankful for you to start today's keynote for this very, very special day that of celebration. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Rano. It's, uh, it's uh, absolutely wonderful to see some, some uh, friends and colleagues. So I know Rano for many years and actually I know several other colleagues. We just uh, talked before the start of this conference about our joint participation in uh, uh, National Science Foundation grant, CellMet, that is based in uh, Boston. So this is another very, very nice collaboration. Um, I, I, I really like that you decided to celebrate the life and uh, science of the first Cuban biomedical engineer. Um, and I think it's very appropriate to do that. And I'm honored that you invited me to speak at, uh, at, at your meeting. So uh, as Rano mentioned, um, uh, my, my research interest and my interest in translation is really in uh, functional human tissues that we make from um, uh, stem cells. And uh, one of these tissue systems that we are studying most extensively is lung. So what I was thinking may be appropriate to do today is to tell you a little bit about our approach to tissue engineering. And then I was going to give you uh, two examples. Uh, one is about um, engineering patient-specific, anatomically correct joints, bone, bone cartilage joints uh, for implantation. And then um, I would also give you an example of um, uh, so-called organs in a chip, which are multi-tissue platforms that we are studying to um, investigate diseases and develop new therapies. But the major part of my talk uh, would be about the engineering uh, human lung. And I decided to do so because of the really seminal work that Dr. Gomez has uh, conducted in this area. So um, to talk about tissue engineering, I think an appropriate uh, start uh, would be to remind ourselves uh, that tissue engineering is really the foundation is in biology because the living cells are responding to all uh, factors, uh, to, to the entire context of their environment. They respond to cytokines, bioactive molecules, they respond to other cells, extracellular matrix and physical factors. And depending on interactions of these factors that typically change both in space and time, some of the genes go up, some of the genes go down, and you get a spectrum of um, outcomes that can range from very favorable, such as self-renewal, self differentiation, functionality, 
to cell apoptosis in that. And it is also important to remind ourselves that these processes go also in the opposite direction because the cells are actively remodeling their environment by secreting cytokines, affecting other cells, making and breaking extracellular matrix and generating forces. So what do we do? We basically um, develop, provide a bioengineering tools that assist the cells in performing their biological function. And two most important tools are the matrix or scaffolding material um, that is serving as a, a structural and uh, a logistic or informational template for the cells to attach and form tissue, and the culture system or bioreactor that is providing environmental control and uh, also regulatory factors that are important to establish and uh, maintain the tissue phenotype. Uh, most of our work really starts from the patient. So there is the clinical need. What is the problem that we need to solve? And uh, you probably all heard a lot about the classical paradigm bench to bedside, which means let's develop technology or product and then translate it into the clinic. But we are trying to do, as well as many other labs in, in recent year, years, is to revert this paradigm a little bit and start from the bedside, start from identifying the clinical problem and the way to solve it, and then going back to bench to find the solution and return to the bedside uh, to test and implement the solution. And the other important factor, something that happened in the field of biomedical engineering, in particular in the last 10 or 15 years, is a very uh, high increase in efficient collaboration between disciplines. So all that we do, we really do in very close collaboration with basic scientists and uh, clinicians. So you start from the patient, you use some kind of stem cells from the patient, adult stem cells. In many cases, this will be um, uh, cells derived from a small sample of blood. In other cases, you may use a little uh, liposuction, small amount of fat. So all different sources, wherever we can find stem cells easily, we can use them. And then you have these two tools that you design, a scaffolded bioreactor that you design in a tissue specific way, because you may imagine that a scaffold that would support formation of a muscle will be very different than the scaffold supporting formation of bone or lung, and uh, the same is true for bioreactor. Tissue engineering as a field has been traditionally focused on regenerative medicine, so we are building pieces of tissues that are functional and suitable for implantation to repair our organs that are lost to injury or disease, that lost their functionality due to injury or disease. Uh, more recently, over the last maybe seven or eight years, there is another direction of using the exact same methodologies to make micro-sized tissues, let's say millimeter-sized tissues of different kinds, so you have liver and lung and bone and heart, you may have tumor tissue, the skin tissue, and you connect these tissues in these small platforms that you call organs in a chip, because they remind a little bit the chips that are used in computer industry, and we connect these tissues by vascular perfusion. So these are really uh, microphysiological units that we designed to model physiological processes, both in health and in disease. So let me give you these first two examples that I mentioned. Uh, one example is bone. Uh, bone is a tissue that's relatively easy to make because the bone has this intrinsic biological ability to regenerate. So you break your arm, it will heal. Uh, the only problem with the bone regeneration is when the injury is large because of massive trauma or a surgery where the tissue is removed for one reason or another, or there may be congenital abnormality when the piece of bone never existed. In this case, you need to make bone de novo and use it to repair damage. So, <coughs> so developing this technology, we decided to give ourselves a really difficult task, which is to uh, regenerate uh, this uh, whole joint 
which is at the top of your lower jaw. This is so-called temporal mandibular joint, and this is the most loaded joint in our body because of the mastication of the chewing forces. So what have we done? We did um, a, a classical CT imaging, computer tomography that is normally done in clinic, composed these images into three-dimensional file that we um, used to drive a microfabrication machine that made us this scaffold made out of mineralized bone matrix that is exactly recapitulating the specific joint in a patient. Uh, we also use this data to engineer, uh, to fabricate the uh, bioreactor chamber. So the chamber is like a negative of the scaffold. So the scaffold fits exactly into the chamber like hand into a glove. And then you infuse the cells into the scaffold and culture these cells in the scaffold for three weeks or four weeks. And the result of this is the living human bone. So this is the idea. Uh, a movie, you isolate the cells, you may take images of the patient, you make a scaffold, you make bioreactor, put scaffold into bioreactor, perfuse culture, obtain a piece of bone, and then eventually this piece of bone would be implanted into the patient. Uh, this piece of bone also has a layer of cartilage. So we had to Besides making this graft anatomically precise, so this is the initial scaffold, we also had to develop a bioreactor system that you see here that allows us to culture bone, uh, which is the bulk of the graft with a very orderly perfusion, but then also to allow the formation of the surface layer of cartilage uh, by uh, applying a different culture medium and different flow conditions. So this is really a dual flow bioreactor that allows you us to form cartilaginous covering of the bone tissue and the tra transition zone in between. Just to tell you that the stem cells that we used in this case were derived from uh, fat. Of course, you get rid of fat cells, but then what is left is the very uh, fluid that is very rich in so-called mesenchymal cells that have capability to form both bone and cartilage. So let me just show you uh, what we have done to test this technology and the result. The gold standard for anything in head and face, craniofacial complex, is a pig, which has is anatomically uh, apparently different than we are, but actually the sizes are uh, very, very similar. Uh, the compositions of the bone, uh, composition of the bones is similar, and also the acting forces are similar. So we have done what I just described to you in a porcine model imaging, making a scaffold, making a bioreactor, taking a little um, a liposuction, like a small amount of fat, isolating cells, uh, uh, infusing cells into the scaffold, engineering this graft, and then we would um, replace the perfectly healthy and fine uh, 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 jaw bone with cartilage, this whole joint, with the engineered graft. So this was the plan. And this is the result. So what you see here at the left side is the bioengineered graft six months after implantation into the animal. And at the right hand side, you see the counterlateral native graft. And you can appreciate that there is a really a great similarity between the two. You see a layer of cartilage, you see this um, lighter um, intermediate transition zone, and then underneath you see the bone tissue. And so seeing this uh, co conclusion is really, cells are very smart. You need to provide them with regulatory cues and they will do their job. And let me just show you a higher magnification of the same image stained for different components of the tissue, where you can again see bioengineered at the left, native at the right, layer of cartilage, transition zone, and underlying bone. So it is not fully equivalent, but we come very, very close to the native tissue. And uh, 
extensive animal studies that we have done over over the years actually uh, brought us to the point that we uh, launched the company in order to commercialize uh, this technology and we are currently uh, uh, doing a clinical study so this is the most exciting and scary phase of the work because now it's real now we, we need to see if the bone is forming and performing equally well in a human model so this was my first story. Uh, let me just uh, give you another story, which is like completely different. I told you that there is this other arm of tissue engineering, which is in a way a fast track application of tissue engineering because it nothing is being implanted. Everything you do, you do in vitro. So how did it start? The whole uh, uh, project of uh, working on so-called organs on a chip or microphysiological platforms has been initiated by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, the problem uh, uh, that we are facing is that bringing a drug to the market in any area of human health is one of the least efficient and most expensive uh, technologies that we have today. This is what you typically see. So the pharmaceutical company would start from candidates. They would start from compounds that may potentially have uh, therapeutic effects. And uh, let's say the company would start from about 10,000 components. Uh, this takes a while, just synthesizing, make, making the libraries of these components. Then they do preclinical studies. Preclinical, uh, 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 in most cases, means either testing the safety and efficacy of the drug in simple culture of cells. For example, if it's a liver drug, you would have a culture of hepatocytes, human hepatocytes, and see if what are the effects of drug. Or you can use whole animal models, and the most popular one is a mouse because of the possibility of having humanized mouse and also having different kinds of knockouts that help you uh, rigorously test diseases. Uh, so this preclinical screening actually reduces the number of compounds to about 250 on average. These are just average numbers that you can find in literature. Uh, preclinical uh, uh, models give you uh, about five compounds that qualify for clinical trials. What happens in the meantime is the huge loss in the number of compounds that are being tested, which is actually not uh, completely, uh, which is, uh, this selection is not done uh, completely accurately because a number of drugs that may be potentially beneficial to humans are lost because they have certain effects on in these preclinical models and vice versa. Their drugs that pass uh, preclinical studies, they come into the clinical trial and then they do not perform in humans, they don't give a clinical result. So you come from 250 to five, from five to one. So one drug on market starting from this large number of compounds after many years of work. And not surprisingly, there is this huge price tag that exceeds $3 billion. And this is not because the drug itself is so expensive. It is actually all this uh, ballast of a, a huge extensive work with a large number of candidates that brings you to this one single approved drug. So NIH asks, can we do better? And keeping in mind the advances in stem cell biology and in, uh, in tissue engineering and the, in the uh, interaction between tissue engineering and uh, clinical sciences, there was this idea that we can start from blood sample of a patient and then derive iPS cells. This is something that it's today being done Routinely, you all know that when Yamanaka found a way to derive adult uh, stem, cell, stem cells from different human sources, this was truly revolutionary for the field. Today, we just work with these cells routinely. And then these cells are used to, to make, to engineer the tissues of interest, depending on the question 
question you are asking, you will have a subset of tissues that you can engineer and you will connect them into these physiological units to model a specific disease or specific developmental process or let's say tissue regeneration or to optimize a therapy to a specific patient. Because keep in mind, this is patient specific. This is a huge value of this organ synergy. So as I told you, this is the paradigm. So you make a patient on a chip that you are using to, for these studies. What is important for this platform? So um, uh, it is very important to design them to be modular, to be configurable, so that you can combine, for example, liver, which is pretty much obligatory part of this platform because of metabolic function, with other tissues such as heart or bone or lung into physiological unit and you can exchange the tissues, change their order, change the number of chambers, etc. It is important that the platform is individualized. I mentioned this starts from a patient and all these tissues are tissues of the specific patient. The very difficult requirement that NIH posed, and this is something that is really a critical for pharmaceutical, pharmacological pharmaceutical testing, is to establish stable, matured tissue phenotypes. So this small uh, uh, micro liver should have at least some of the functions of the adult human liver. And same is true for other tissues. The difficulty of this requirement is twofold. To find methodologies to mature human tissues in vitro, this is not easy, but then in addition, to maintain these matured phenotypes while tissues are connected by vascular perfusion. So there is a flow that is connecting, so these tissues communicate to each other. And uh, I'll show you how we have done this. And uh, then there is also a requirement to have functional readouts of different kinds, for example, contractile function or metabolism, uh, so that we can do longitudinal studies. So the way we, just to go back to this most difficult requirement, the way we really addressed it is by mimicking um, uh, how our pro body is solving the same problem. So we culture each of the tissues in their separate chamber, in their optimal culture medium with the optimal set of regulatory factors. But then we have a circulation of a vascular circulation, which is separated from the tissue chamber by endothelial barrier. So our body functions based on compartments and boundaries. And this is exactly what we have done here. And this little video at the right shows you that platform is very easily assembled. So uh, biological specificity or individualized approach is important, as I mentioned. So you start from the iPS cells and then you derive all these different lineages that you need for different uh, tissue and organ systems. And uh, keep in mind that actually every single tissue has multiple types of cells. So it's not only the tissue specific cells such as cardiomyocyte, it is the supporting cells such as fibroblasts, um, um, endothelial cells, and then you have additional stromal cells. So this is something that we have done by adopting and adapting uh, some of the existing protocols in the field. This is a, 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 a menu of matured functional uh, human tissues that we have available that we can make uh, from any IPS line. So these are sensory neurons, heart muscle, bone alone, bone with bone marrow, liver, vasculature, tumors, skin, um, skeletal muscle also coupled with the motor neurons so that we have neuromuscular junction and then some of the circulating cells and in particular the immune cells uh, that are very important for pretty much all functions of the tissues. 
Uh, let me just show you a couple examples. Um, one example is human bone marrow module. So what we do is we engineer a piece of human bone, as I showed you in this first example. And uh, to this end, we used osteoblast, mesenchymal stromal cells, and endothelial cells that are all derived from the same iPS cells. And once this niche is established, we actually seed the niche with the CD34 positive cells. Uh, so uh, we first started from cord blood derived cells to establish the system, and now we switch to iPS derived CD34 positive cells. So what happens over a period of time, so it takes about a month to form bone marrow, is that you get expression of all these important markers, the microstructure of the form uh, of the bone. Um, uh, you have the bone, uh, the, the cells that actually have colony forming capacity, which is very important. And most importantly, we have functional hematopoiesis with expansion of both CD45 positive and CD34 positive cells. So bone marrow is really important, as you may imagine. Uh, uh, also as a source of, uh, of the um, immune cells. Uh, the second example is heart muscle. So we developed a methodology to form uh, heart muscle between two elastic pillars that you see here uh, by encapsulating uh, iPS-derived cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts in a hydrogel. And then we um, electrically stimulate this tissue using signals that um, recapitulate those that are stimulating our heart. So these are the signals that are deep polarizing all cells at the same time and make them twitch. What you see here in the middle, top middle, is this contractile apparatus. So these are these registers of sarcomeres that you see here. And these structures here, these blobs, are mitochondria. So this is the energy factory of the cell. So when you see such a strong biogenesis of mitochondria, you know that these cells is electromechanically very active. And when we compare here at the bottom right the density of mitochondria in our engineered muscle, with that in the healthy, normal adult human heart, they were in the same range. Importantly, these uh, tissues uh, that you see here at the top right as a cross section through the muscle uh, have a very, very nice uh, adult like morphology. So the red is the body of the cell. So this is troponin staining. And then the green are the cell membranes. And you see this small imaginations, these very thin green lines that are very thin and very important. These are so-called transverse tubules or T-tubules that are facilitating calcium handling. And this is the condition for functionality. So these tissues have action potentials with this notch that is very important, that has the right amplitude and duration. And they, in order to function this way, they switch pretty much immediately when we start stimulation from glycolytic, which is prenatal, to oxidative, which is postnatal metabolism. And the third example is this skeletal muscle that I mentioned that we make the same way as the heart muscle. And then we also have a neurosphere that we culture in a way that we stimulate the extension of axons that you see here at the bottom. So the axons are going to the skeletal muscle and cutting. In order to uh, control and follow these processes, we started from the same population of the cells, but then the part of the cells that is used to uh, to derive the neurosphere was optogenetically edited so that neurosphere is light sensitive. So you shine light at the neurosphere at the right wavelength in the neurosphere, these uh, neurons are firing and they are um, actually uh, contacting the skeletal muscle. And if the junction is functional, the muscle will twitch. So what you see here at the top, uh, at the right, is at the top is the response of a healthy muscle. So like most of these light signals are followed by 
contraction, the twitch of the muscle. If you add to this culture serum antibodies from a patient that has dysfunction of the neuromuscular junction, such as patients uh, suffering from myasthenia gravis, there is no response. So what we are doing with the system now is we are using it for testing a new class of drugs for other uh, uh, diseases of the neuromuscular junction. And uh, I, I, I mentioned that these systems are modular, they're configurable, you can do all sorts of things. So we are studying, for example, cancer patient on a chip that uh, basically we have a model of, uh, of uh, uh, breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer metastasis on a chip using completely human derived tissues and primary cancer cells. We are working with different other models. We are also uh, lending uh, these platforms to our colleagues that are studying beta cells, insulin secreted cells. So they're also very suitable to host organoids. And uh, so there is pretty broad utility. And this is also one part of this, which is the heart on the chip is also has also been commercialized and it's being used um, to collaborate with the pharmaceutical companies, large pharmaceutical companies for drug discovery and developmental testing of drugs. And now switch to lung, which is probably the most um, interesting topic for today's conference. So I would just like to remind you that lung is an incredibly complex organ. So what you see here is the preparation of the human lung so that um, only airway is visible. So it was uh, infused with a polymer and then everything else was removed. And you see here this branching structure of the lung. There are about 25 forks here from the trachea to the, the most distal lung to the alveolar spaces. And then the other part of the lung that is interfacing with the with the airway is vasculature that you see is equally, uh, equally complex and equally evolved. And this may be a good moment to actually remind ourselves how it all started. Today, we have all these great technologies to evaluate structure of the lung, but actually Dr. Gomez didn't have anything at his time. And you know that he was really the first one who started to develop mathematical and engineering principles and methodologies to evaluate, to determine the structure of the lung. And so this is one of his really uh, seminal, seminal papers. And uh, the other paper is the one which is my favorite, where he figured out what is the, and represented the, the structure, the anato anatomy of, of the lung in mathematical terms. And he was really translating this biological images into engineering images and uh, really rationalizing the architecture of the human lung. So this is what you see here is the really the um, title of the paper and the gist of the paper. It's about the use of quantitative methods uh, for establishing fundamental relations between size and number of lung structures. So this was a long, long way, uh, uh, ago. You see, this is um, uh, 1962, and the field has advanced. And um, I mean, I don't think these beginnings have been forgotten or should be forgotten because they are really incredibly important. In addition to this uh, very, very complex architecture, uh, lung also has many cell types. So there is a, a epithelium and there is a vascular component. Epithelium alone has some 50 different cell types. And here in this image that we actually published this illustration in one of the recent papers, it is described that going from the large airway to smaller airway and distal lung alveolar spaces, you have this very large change in the cell types and distributions along 
epithelon. Uh, there are uh, just some representative types of the cells that are very important for lung development and lung re regeneration. And at the right, it's the same thing shown in a little bit simpler picture, just to make a point, many different cells interacting with each other, typically uh, just forming a layer of the cells. So you have a layer of epithelium, you have a basement membrane that is sitting at the bottom of this layer, and then you have epithelium, uh, uh, um, and, sorry, endothelium vascular cells on the other side in most of this range region of the lung. So how it started, I, I mentioned at the beginning that much of the work that we do starts with a clinical problem. And this really started with a visit of um, Columbia uh, lung transplant surgeons who approached us with the crisis that they're facing on a daily basis that they just don't have enough donor lungs for the patients that are uh, at the, uh, presenting the end stage lung disease. To make the crisis even more serious, they have to reject most, the majority of these lungs because they are not suitable for transplant, they're just not functional enough, or there is an injury that was not noticed, or another reason. And they already mentioned how complex is the lung. At that time, this was some eight years ago, the field was also uh, making strides towards bioengineering the lung. Uh, you can make a piece of lung, lung-like structure outside the body. Uh, lung is in particular present in these organs on the chip systems where there is a very good way to, um, to model alveolar space, to model, to model actually this epithelial endothelial interface, but you cannot make the whole lung. And any whole lung that was engineered using one technology or another would fail very shortly after implantation. So this still remains a very elusive goal for the field. So we asked ourselves if we can instead, if we can repair the rejected lungs instead of trying to make lungs de novo. So a little bit of uh, a background. So, uh, so you have donor who, th there is a donor lung. And as I mentioned, when these donor lungs are procured, only a minority of these donor lungs is, are uh, declared suitable for transplant. And the question was, can we increase, can we start from these unused lungs and somehow fix them, at least some of them, to make them available to the patient. Uh, current technology, uh, the, the, the state of the art of the lung uh, uh, maintenance and repair um, ex vivo outside the body is a so-called ex vivo lung perfusion, EVLP. So this is a machine that is ventilating the lung and circulating fluid through the lung, which is a solution that just keeps the lung hydrated and it's trying to keep it in a viable state. These machines are really, um, uh, they have limited lifetime and depending on what is your criteria and who you ask, it is as, as short as six hours of lifetime outside the body or maybe 12 or maybe a little longer, but not very long. So we started to think about like, how can we potentially provide a more homeostatic and a longer duration environment to the lung that would uh, give us time to intervene, to do some repair on the lung, because you cannot do much in six or eight hours. There is no way. So when you think about how the body does it, the body, the body has all these organs that are actually taking care of the re, uh, metabolism, removal of metabolic products, their clearance from the body. So the lung is not, doesn't have a load of these uh, metabolic products that are harmful and that are really limiting the lifetime of uh, medical equipment of this support on medical equipment. 
So then we came to the idea, which is actually something that was explored on animal models some years ago. Like, can we just have the patient awaiting the lung transplant, supporting the lung that they are about to receive and thereby uh, uh, get some time to evaluate and to, and to improve this lung. So this was the idea. To test this idea, we returned to our favorite animal model and decided to investigate how long and under which conditions can we maintain an injured or like a sub-functional human lung for any other reason by connecting it to the uh, living host. So there are two components to this. One component is the respirator. So the lung has to be ventilated. This is always the case. But then instead of perfusing steam solution or another solution through the lung, we connect the lung to the vascular perfusion of this living host. So the lung is blood perfused and it is uh, ventilated. So this was an idea. And then we started working on it seven, eight years ago. And during this time, we really established three methodological advances that form a basis of technology that I'll uh, uh, describe to you shortly. One is this a longer term support that we call cross circulation, because there is a blood circulation between the lung and the uh, living host. The other uh, advance is that we, um, in, a, in, the, in the consult with clinicians, we found out that in many cases, the lung is not uniformly damaged. So there are very often some pockets that are hypoxic or um, injured physically or just have defective cellular material for one reason or another. So we also developed the technology that allows us to identify these regions and to approach them. So this is really targeted approach where we remove the defective cellular material and in the same session, we replace it with healthy therapeutic cells. So this is the regional treatment of the lung. The basis for this was information from the, uh, from the pulmonologists and uh, lung transplant surgeons that in many cases, lung is missing just 10 or 20% or 25% of the function. So you think, okay, so if I fix the 10 or 20% of the most damaged reasons, this will bring up the lung function by this necessary increment, which makes difference between useful for transplant and not useful for transplant. And then the third piece is that much of the lung damage is on the lung epithelium. So the cells that are in contact with the air that we breathe. So you have these layers of epithelial cells that I showed you in one of the previous images. And then underneath is a very, very thin basement membrane. And on the other side are uh, endothelial cells and vascular flow. So we found a way to remove only epithelial cells without compromising the basement membrane and not affecting the vasculature at all and replace defective epithelium with healthy epithelium. So what you see here on this immunostain, a green are um, epithelial cells and red are endothelial vascular cells. So this is the starting situation after removing the cells. You see that most of the epithelium is gone and vasculature, which is here um, shown in red, is uh, pretty much preserved. So this is the setting. Uh, what you see at the left is a typical setup of an uh, o OR for lung transplant. So this is the lung and uh, you have all these instruments that are necessary to maintain, monitor and maintain its well-being. And here would be a patient. So there is 
oversight monitoring of both the, the donor lung and the patient. In our case, this lung is the lung, donor lung that we are treating, and under the drapes is not the patient, it's a pig that is supporting by cross circulation this lung. Lung is ventilated, you cannot see it very clearly here, but it is connected to ventilator and it is connected to jugular blood vessels of the animal. In addition to all this regular instrumentation, we also have here uh, thermal imaging that allows us to monitor uh, vascular flow in the lungs, something very important. And then we had some micro-sized um, bronchoscopes catheters that we were using for regional uh, inspection and treatment of the lung. With this model of ventilated lung connected to uh, the blood supply of the living host, we were able to study a number of different modalities for repairing lung. Obviously, what you deliver as a therapy will depend on what is the injury that you are treating. So let me show one result. So this, is, this was one of the first studies. This is for porcine lung, pig lung. So initially, we brought this lung into the state, the extracorporeal lung, into the state of very serious ischemia after many, many hours without oxygen supply, which is mimicking the conditions during the transport of the lungs. And the lung, you see the pale whitish areas here. So this is, these are the areas that are very hypoxic, which was confirmed by thermal imaging. So these dark areas are low temperature areas, which means that the lung was not perfused with blood uh, because the normal physiologic temperature goes between um, red and yellow. And over time of cross circulation, 12 hours, 24, 36, you see very clearly that the status of the lung was improving and it was supported by this thermal images, giving us more and more normal picture. The key question is obviously, is it functional? So one of the ways and probably the most critical way to evaluate lung function are so-called pressure volume loops. Uh, what you see here labeled as control, this loop at the far left is how it should look. This is the healthy lung. The way the lung works is that very small difference in pressure is generating large volume, moving large volume of air that we inhale Inhale and exhale. In the lung that I showed you in the previous image, this initial injured lung had very defective lobes. So even with much higher pressure difference, the volume of air that was transported was very small. During the recovery, this loop was moving from this red initial state through yellow 12 hours and then um, green, which is 24 hours and blue 36 hours. So you can see that we came from here to here. This is not exactly normal, but this was acceptable. This was good enough functionally to be useful. And then there are many, many other parameters that we measured. What you see here is the efficiency of oxygen utilization, essentially how much oxygen that you inhale ends up in your blood. And this parameter, like many others, were also came into the normal range. And not surprisingly, this was, uh, um, uh, this was associated with the improvement in the lung, um, um, in, in the lung appearance histologically, morphologically, because you see here in the airway and in the vasculature, a lot of inflammation, a ton of inflammatory cells, and actually this inflammation in both regions uh, cleared when we, um, uh, during the course of cross circulation. So now another advance that we made more recently is not, um, this first um, variation of the protocol gave us uh, 36 hours of extracorporeal support, which was sufficient to repair ischemic lungs, but not all lungs can repair over 36 hours. So we extended the, the uh, duration of cross circulation support to 100 hours by uh, make, um, providing support by a wake animal that was 
actually for this um, four, four, four or five days of uh, experimentation was in this contraption that we constructed the, the animal was playing and eating and sleeping and just moving linearly in one direction like on a trolley so that these uh, connections do not get entangled. And then finally, we switched uh, from uh, porcine lungs to human lungs, following the same paradigm that the patient may one day, at least some of the patients should be able to support their own lung while being that they are going to receive while being um, uh, on, uh, on um, extracorporeal support. And so we started to study human lungs that are ventilated and supported by cross circulation with the porcine host. And I'll show you here some of the results. So what you see here at the left is a sequence of three images, initial status of the lung, 12 hours of repair and 24 hours of repair. So this was one of the lungs that we received for research. And this happens only after multiple medical centers evaluate the lung and reject it as unusable. And we were able to recover this lung and all other lungs that we have received. And uh, you can see here some um, uh, pictures of the lung morphology. You see very clear improvement in vascular region and in the middle and, um, and uh, alveolar spaces at the bottom, where actually the tissue is clearing of all the cells that shouldn't be there of inflammation and assuming much more normal appearance. And when you measure functionality, this looked pretty much what they showed you for the recovery of ischemic lung. So the cross circulation is a methodology that we are very excited about. So we are using it to expand the pool of lungs that can be uh, uh, that can be uh, improved functionally and structurally, and uh, brought to the state that they meet the transplantation criteria. But we are also using cross circulation for studies of different diseases and possible therapeutic modalities. So this really gives you like a whole organ outside the body under controllable conditions for a specific period of time. And, uh, and most recently, about a year ago, we started to translate some of these methodologies into lung repair in situ. This was inspired in in, to some extent with the COVID crisis. Uh, you probably know that the uh, most uh, <clears throat> uh, serious complication of COVID in the human lung is this acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is the stage when patient needs um, ventilation support, when it becomes ex uh, extremely difficult to breathe on your own. And so we started to develop this model, the model of arts, in a large animal, again, a swine, with the idea that we may also uh, investigate lung repair in situ. So there is a methodology for inducing arts, and then uh, this animal with the arts can uh, last much, much longer than ex vivo lung. So this also gives us an opportunity for long-term follow-ups of different interventions, including in particular cell therapy. Because even over 100 hours, if you do cell therapy of the lung, you see initial data, you don't really see the actual outcomes of the, of the cellular engraftment. And you can use this, and we are starting to use this for a number of different interventions, from cellular therapy to genetic manipulations that are important for some um, congenital diseases, you know, about cystic fibrosis and other diseases that are uh, due to uh, gene mutations and then genetic corrections of the cells is the way to go. And this is all done in conjunction with all these bioengineering methodologies of very specifically targeting a various type, various regions of the lung and intervening there. So 
let me just try to recap in two minutes what I tried to tell you today overall, and which really, I believe, reflects the state of the art of the field of tissue engineering today. The first and most important thing is uh, our engineering designs are fully um, based on the biological principles. It is really biology that is driving the ways how we engineer our tissues. Cells are the architects of the tissue, engineers of the tissue. What we do, what our job is uh, to provide the cells with the right environment. And it's very convenient that the same principles can be applied to whole organ engineering and organ summit chips. So the two um, directions of tissue engineering are really interacting and supporting each other. Uh, our goal uh, when we engineer tissue is to recapitulate or recover uh, some of the normal functions of the tissues and organs. Uh, for this, we need mature tissue phenotypes, and the standing question for decades now is how much is enough? How complex, how accurate, how close to the real tissue function needs your system needs to be to be useful? This brings us to the standing problem of benchmarking and validation. We really like to validate our tissues against clinical data, but in many cases, you can also use animal models to draw some, some parallels. Validation is difficult. Uh, in this field, you deal with different types of data obtained at different scales at different times, and integration and interpretation of these different types of data uh, will, I think, remain a challenge for a, for a long time. And finally, the fact that we use the patient's own cells, in most cases iPS cells, allow you biological specificity, which then allows you two things. One is in regenerative, in regenerative therapies or treatment of disease, you really exercise precision medicine modalities where the therapy is fully tailored to the patient. When you are modeling diseases or studying doing biological research, you can really study biological diversity because we are all very different from each other. Sex, age, race, status of health all determine how we function and how we respond to disease and to treatment. And the very last slide is to just thank my lab. So this is where the work happens. So this is the our one of the last images, last photos before COVID. I mean, everything else is a Zoom photo with people sitting in different places. So I thank them for everything. This is actually, as you know, this is the best part of our academic life, mentoring the young talent. Also, a big thank you to our many collaborators. Nothing would happen without them and funding sources. And I would like to sincerely thank you for this opportunity to be here today and to talk to you on this um, on the occasion of this very, very special uh, 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 conference. Thank you, Dr. Gordana. This is such a fantastic, fantastic talk that bridged all the way from what you have to do to do investigation, to repair, to recovery. So the whole pathway that you uh, presented to us. There might be people on the on uh, listening to us who are not biomedical engineers for sure, but maybe not even scientists. And I want to really bring out and appreciate that when you first showed us, like for example, the bone stuff, the personalized medicine aspect specifically looking at what is happening in bone structures, using that, and then manipulating that through science and through engineering to get us to recovery. I also want to point out what you said in your summary slide, the importance of the breadth that we need to have of computational models, of bench side work, whole animal and large animal model, the importance of having animal research as part of the continuing the continuum and then taking things into humans. So the different platforms for research that you pointed out, pointed out to us. And what 
of what an amazing breadth and depth of knowledge that you have contributed and that you have brought to us. I want to appreciate your linking us to the lung, beautiful lung structure and the computational models of the structure that Dr. Domingo did way, way to put the path forward for us. Started it, yeah. Yeah. And so let me ask you a few questions. And please, sure. uh, audience, if you have questions, you can uh, put them in the Q&A and so that I can uh, uh, ask those. So one person asked, how long can you keep the organ on chip model of the different modules viable? Uh, we don't know for sure how long. So far, we are uh, routinely keeping them for a month or two, depending on this is really driven by the need. They can last pretty long altogether. Great. Then the second question is from this is Maide Mosnem, a doctoral student who's finishing up pretty soon. Do you have any biosensors embedded within your platform for continuous monitoring of physiological parameters? And if yes, what type of sensors are you relying on? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, we have sensors for environmental factors such as oxygen or pH. This is important. Uh, we also have systems that allow us to measure some of the important properties. For example, for all barrier tissues like epithelium, endothelium, uh, skin tissue, uh, the resistance that you can measure electrically is an excellent indicator of the integrity. For example, is your endothelial layer uh, quiescent and confluent. So this is so-called tear measurement. So you have a little contraption that you place into the chamber and you continuously get these signals. And we also have for some tissues, for example, for liver, the real functional assay is what you can measure from the culture medium, secretome. And then we have a sampling systems that allow us to take very small microliter volume um, of media for um, analytics outside the system. Uh, I, uh, maybe I can ask you uh, a follow up on that same question is that these are sensors that you have in your lab on a chip system. Now, on the other hand, you showed beautiful outcomes of the lung repair. Oh, okay. You know? So I wonder what kind of sensing mechanism could be yeah, there. A lung, a lung system is very, very heavily instrumented. So we have a lot. And uh, lung is, uh, uh, first of all, we have uh, not only sensors, but also feedback loops to maintain pressure differences that need to be controlled very, very precisely, both in the air, air space and in the vasculature. Um, we have uh, uh, controllers of the flow. We have these microcatheters for sampling fluid from the lung, for uh, also taking biopsies of the cell. There is a lot, but actually I can, if you, Medeh, if you email to me, I can just send you papers. They are super long method sections, if you are interested, that describe either organ the chip instrumentation or uh, instrumentation uh, for the lung uh, ex vivo. One more question. Can organs on a chip replace clinical trials eventually? Maybe, maybe, you know, like at this point, they're really adding to the clinical trials. <clears throat> it is very encouraging to see that there is a lot of predictability, that we are able to recapitulate a lot of uh, uh, prom uh, a lot of parameters that are being measured in clinical trials, but I think it would be pretentious, a little arrogant to say, oh yeah, they will replace clinical trials. I think we should just assume that at this point it is um, animal models that still have a big role because this is the whole organism that you can use. Um, organs on a chip and clinical data. And this is this triad that we need to use in a clever way to extract the data into. The whole idea is you do need to carry out the clinical trial at the end of the day, because I don't think it would be a good idea to go from organ on chip into the patient. But what we are trying to do is to help de-risk these clinical trials. Uh, 
to really inform them in a way so that you play as safe as humanely possible at the time when you go uh, into the patient with the therapy or the drug. I have another question for you. Since students may be here, and I see that you have several companies that have been launched. Could you comment if these were launched by your students or postdocs? And so if how, maybe, you know, you know we'll- Yeah. I'm so yeah, yeah. I'm so glad, Rana, that you that you asked this question. So, we had four so far, and uh, each of them was launched together with students and postdocs. So the scenario was there is uh, we discover something or develop something, we, you file patent, and then people who worked on the project are co-inventors, and then you publish, and then. In some cases, you also launch company and uh, uh, people who worked on this, so, so people who published the work and are patent co-inventors are also co-founders and they own pieces of company. But the best part for me is that in each of these four cases, uh, people from lab uh, who were normally like planning to go into academia or somewhere else, they would just say, I would really, really like to go to this company and run it. So CEOs, CSOs are actually people who develop technology. And this is your technology. And there is this passion. There is this very, very different attitude to, to work than if, if you are a generic CEO coming from somewhere and taking company over. So, so we do have some senior, uh, very uh, savvy people, you know, from the business world, but really the heart and soul of our companies are the people who develop technologies either as uh, doctoral students or postdocs or uh, clinical fellows. Thank you very much. So this really it says, you know, brings home, um, you know, the passion of biomedical engineers. What you said in the beginning, take a problem that is of clinical need, find a solution, take it back to clinic. And not only we are doing that, but as you, as a leader of this field, are uh, paving the path is not just take it and give it to clinical trial, but make sure that it is available for many future patients by commercializing. Absolutely. So I think we have gone beyond bedside to bench to bedside to one more step that yeah, we I are adding so. and we are getting our students to do. I think so too. And then again, thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And uh, and um, again, like good luck with everything. And I hope that this is not the last time that we are interacting in some, in yes. some way. So fantastic. Thank you.